production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, Meet a Columbus artist who makes quilts out of photographs. I've always been interested in pattern, uh, geometric patterns, squares, triangles. Three local writers reflect upon the impact of the Harlem Renaissance. And baby, it's cold inside as we visit the studio of a world champion ice carver. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High. I'm WOSU producer Jackie Schaefer, filling in for Kate Quickle, who's on maternity leave. For our first story tonight, we'd like to introduce you to Columbus-based artist Chris Mercerhill. He's a quilter, but not in the traditional sense. Instead of using fabric, he sews together photographs. And if you look closely, you might recognize some iconic Columbus landmarks. Here's his story. I'm originally from Toronto, Canada. I came to the United States to go to graduate school. Met my wife there in South Carolina. We moved to Illinois and then back to Ohio because it's closer to home. So kind of a classic story, really. I've always been interested in patterns, you know, shapes, uh, squares, triangles. So when I set out to make a photo quilt, a quilt made of photos sewn together, I, I start with an image. So this, this is an image of um, the North Market. So I'm gonna use this photo and I'm gonna make its mirror image. For the bottom half of the quilt, I'll cut these two inches off. And then the next layer, I'll cut uh, one, and a, one and three quarters and a little bit off of here. And then I march it down like this. So by the end, by the top row, I'm using these, this, this is my four inch square. So the effect this creates is from the top to the bottom, the, the, the source image shifts slightly and changes. And these lines, which are at you know, odd angles, um, really lend this dynamism. They, they intersect in really uh, interesting ways that create diamond shapes and, and points and, and spikes. traditional quilts they're made with fabric and so often you know the story is uh, this is my grandma's apron and this is my aunt Myrtle's dress that she wore to Sunday school and for me I can capture memories through photographs I can I can identify patterns or places or things and then use them in much the same way make a quilt out of those instead of out of fabric and so it's all about you know exploring the city finding interesting viewpoints, finding things that, that reach out to me as a, as a really dynamic image, and then I cut them up and sew them together and see what happens. When I was in Illinois, I started working on a pattern called Log Cabin, which is sort of a square with these strips all the way around that just repeat and repeat and repeat, which kind of gives the effect of a log cabin. And I was in the land of Lincoln, when I came to Ohio a little over 10 years ago, um, you know, I was thinking and exploring, and I found this Ohio Star pattern. And so the, the Ohio Star pattern, it's called a nine patch quilt. There's a group of patterns called that because they're three squares by three squares. And so this one, uh, four of the squares have triangles that sort of form an X. And so the thing I like about these is you get these, where these four triangles come together, you get these sort of kaleidoscopic y, diamond y spots. And then there's this pattern that sort of repeats uh, square, triangle, square, but when you put it next to another block, it's square, triangle, square. So right when you think you've discovered the pattern, square, triangle, square, 
that's not a triangle, that's another square. And it, it's, it, to my eye, it's complicated enough that you have to sort of look twice to really figure it out. And I don't always feel like when I'm looking at it that I've figured it out. One thing I really try to do with my work is, is to create objects that you can appreciate both up close and from a distance. So from a distance, it almost looks like a carpet or wallpaper or interesting shapes. And then you get up close and you go, hey, there's a person there. They're walking down an aisle. Is that the North Market? And you kind of look and go, that's the North Market. I love fabric quilts. I make fabric quilts. Uh, my wife and I make fabric quilts together. But for me, there's something about photographs and sewing them together. And I guess maybe it's the, um, the resolution, the clarity you can get with a photograph that um, really sets it apart from fabric. I think my work is sort of about noticing the beauty around us and, uh, you know, sort of stopping and pausing and appreciating it in, in, in a way maybe we haven't before. Follow Chris on Instagram where you can see even more examples of his photo quilts and artistic process. Or check out his website at chrismercerhill.com. This year, Columbus has been celebrating the 100th anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance. It was a social and artistic explosion of black culture that gave rise to such influential writers as Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. We sat down with three Columbus writers who recently took to the stage at the Columbus College of Art and Design to share their original work and reflect on this important moment in American history. One of the things that I love about the Harlem Renaissance was the act of telling stories. You know, I started out by saying, what stories do I want to tell? The elders put a hush over your life long before I was born. It took me 30 years to learn your name, another five to find out how you died. Mary Eliza um, is my great-grandmother, who was a married woman with six children. She died after having an abortion. I am sorry. You are our family's dirty secret. Keep in mind, this was, I mean, this was somewhere around 19, 1906 when this happens, 1907, uh, a decision that she made with her husband because they were poor and had six kids already, you know, and the family that elders in the family decided we are not going to talk about this after she died. We just will not talk about this ever again, which means we will not talk about her ever again. Neither of you want to see the slow death that comes with starvation times six, seven must be undone. I wanted to resurrect her name. I did not want um, her uh, spirit or her memory to be one of shame anymore, you know, in our family or for me. And so I, I really wanted to honor her. How many women do you welcome to the other side who lost their lives the same way you did? I am sorry that we don't talk about you. Your children learn not to speak your name. Your grandchildren know not to ask questions, but you have a great granddaughter who doesn't take to these lessons of silence. I want to say your name in more than a whisper. Mary Eliza, you have nothing to be ashamed of. Mary Eliza, I am resurrecting your memory right now. Mary Eliza, Women aren't dying anymore the way you died, at least not for now. The best part about poetry for me is the physical effects that certain sounds in the language can make on a listener and a reader. This is called Ode to Kool-Aid. You turn the kitchen tap's metallic stream into tropical drink. Extra sugar whirlpooling 
to the pitcher bottom like gypsum sand. Purple saurus rex, roaring rockadile red, ice blue island twist, sharkleberry fin. On our tongues, each version keeps a section like tiles on the elemental table. I'm from Toledo, Ohio, which um, in its heyday was uh, a poor man's Detroit. <laughs> you know, it's cold, it's really ugly in the winter, it's slushy, it's, it's gray, a lot of rusty warehouses, most of them empty. So I think that internally is always in my, unfortunately, my outlook and my mood. Um, but it's definitely always in my poems and how I want to make, um, make lines and sentences. Um, I wrote my first book when I was living in Harlem and a lot of the poems at some points find their ways to sectors uh, within Upper Manhattan and Harlem. One of the wonderful things about New York is the proximity and the in each other's facedness uh, that exists there when it comes to socioeconomic class. Um, and that was the first time I had ever really been around wealth or big time money. You don't own any suits that cost less than my rent. Your office perches at Hawk's View. Mahogany paneled champagne fridge to toast successful deals. My mailroom radio trills. Speaker mesh bleary like a carpet layer's knees. From your Tribeca residence, you can view the Empire State Building light nightly like a national candle. At my D train stop, outside a turnstile, a couple roars at each other over a squandered metro card. <laughs> So I'm born and raised in Columbus. I grew up in the North London neighborhood. I studied writing and I studied psychology and neuroscience. I thought I was going to be a doctor. I, <laughs> I am not <laughs> a doctor, but I did turn out to be like a really good writer. I do like to make people uncomfortable, but that's just to start a conversation. I'm an essayist. So I write creative nonfiction and I kind of, I, I love nonfiction because there's this honesty about it. What's on the page is just like raw. My family didn't go to church. We celebrated Christmas by gathering to eat ham and greens as a family. In my household, there was a God and sometimes we referred to that God as God and sometimes as Jah. A couple years ago, my friend texted me very randomly and first he was talking about aliens and then he said, do I think God is a black woman? Why is she? Why isn't she? What would it be like if she was? And so I took that text conversation we had and turned it to an essay. It's a hybrid piece that imagines what God would be like as a woman. So there are a lot of like visual, visceral, like descriptions of God doing things like creating the earth. So I think I'm going to read that piece because it's fun. <laughs> My ex-lover is trying to bridge biology and religion by making God a black woman. His argument is birth. His argument converges both evolution and creationism, saying that she must have created evolution in order to create man, that she birthed the universe. I ignore him, more intrigued with black female God. I want to know her. I want to feel her. I want to believe that somehow my essence embodies her. Black female God. He thinks about it from the perspective of a man. Who gave birth to Adam? But instead, I imagine an exhausted black female god floating in the universe, surrounded by her planets. The waxiness of afterbirth causes them to orbit around her, the original home birth. And maybe she inspects each planet before choosing Earth from the middle of the litter. She trails her fingers across its fragile surface, accidentally creating crevices and surface flaws, continent and ocean. If God is a black woman and she created the planets, where would Adam and Eve fit in? Eventually, she had to create life. Black woman God eclipsing the light as she spun Earth around on the pad of her finger, wondering what was missing. A dark planet reflecting her own skin and its land, her eyes and its water. For the first time, she sees herself. And it is a birth rather than a creation as she gathers dust from the universe, weaving them together with breath, maybe whispering an incantation for life or for strength before dropping into the dark and listening for the splash. And she waited. 
If God is a black woman, would she have granted Lucifer his own domain? Would there even be a hell? What does it mean if Lucifer is a black angel or a black man? Or would she have picked him up between her forefinger and thumb, crushing him into dust before scattering his remains across the galaxy? I doubt she would put up with his drama. We have a responsibility to give commentary to the times in which we live. Any, any historical period that you look at, if you want to know what people were really thinking, check out the art that was created during that time, and that'll really give you some insight of what people were actually experiencing, even outside of what's written in history books. And I feel like Columbus is on the verge of its own renaissance, like so many wonderful things are happening. Visit SeabusHarlem100.org to find all kinds of events around town that are celebrating the Harlem Renaissance, like the Jazz Arts Group and its presentation of Songs and Sounds of the Harlem Renaissance, happening on January 18th at Lincoln Theater. You can visit JazzArtsGroup.org for those details. Next up is an artist who will never complain that her office is too cold, because that's just how she wants it. Her studio is a freezer, her tool is a chainsaw, and her canvas is usually a three-foot block of clear ice. I think many times it, it just shows your dreams. And that's what you're looking in ice, you know, what you're dreaming too, you know, so it's, it's magical. I'm originally from Croatia, that's where I grew up, and uh, come here. We are actually chefs. We do cooking and um, ice carvings were just part of the Sunday brunches. So that's how I started. And uh, I started to carve, you know, the little cheese and, and uh, fruits, vegetables, you know, these little flowers from it. And that's how it started. It's different, you know, the ice is cold, but it can show so much more than regular clay. It's physical too, and you have to have certain energy to carve it. And I, I like that. These are sculptures uh, now for the Plymouth Eye Show. They're gonna be displayed at some of the clients and vendors there who requested them. So I'm very happy that I could come there and sculpt it. You have to visualize it, you know, the whole piece, how it's gonna look when it's done. And what you see in front of you is just block of ice, you know, square, blank. First you make your the, the little you know, outline and like a template. And then you start taking away all these, um, you know, extra parts which don't belong to, to show the picture you had in your head when you started. I use the chainsaw to carve out the majority shape, you know, of the eyes. Then I uh, lay it around for more intricate work to uh, smooth down the surface and to carve it a little more in. I use the sander. Then uh, there is the chisels, you know, which I use if I want that it looks, you know, more like a crystal and, and, you know, it shapes it more. Then also the die grinders, which, you know, adds like the fine details, like an eyes, like a little swirl is around, you know, hair, you know, all this, you know, final details, that's what I use. And on the end, um, I use the torch, you know, the fire to melt down the surface to make it to look like a glass. I do like the crystal look, you know, the, the ice is clear and I try to show the, the clearness and purity of the ice too. We produce our ice blocks here in the studio. Basically this is the machines, the ice block makers where we make our ice. The average take three to four days to freeze block of ice, they come 300 pounds. This is actually ready ice to be harvested for the uh, ice carvings. So it will take, uh, we'll hook them up on these two clips and uh, lift them out. Some of the blocks I freeze the items inside and then I carve around it. Like for the weddings I had um, ice cubes and there is an orchids frozen inside. So it's one flower, you know, inside and it's all beauty. So it's, it's kind of different <laughs> look to it. Well, the corporate parties, you know, they, they like more their logos and less of the details on it because, you know, it needs to show their logo. 
On Alaska, the blocks tend to be very big, so you can create a really large ice carvings. Some of the ice carvings are about 30 feet tall, so it took us four people for a whole week to carve on Alaska. It takes lots of preparation to coordinate, you know, all four carvers to, to come together and to carve that one piece, one dream. You try to show the power, you know, what is inside of these. Uh, it's not just a block of ice anymore, you know. It's they, you know, they have to, they have to look like they're big and powerful. When you look at the ice carvings, you can see different things. So it's completely up to the viewers to see. Also, there is kids. There is always kids around, and they go and they see. Oh, look! There is a dragon. You know, there is a little goldfish. There is fairy and it just forms your heart you know when you hear that so you just have to continue i love to be here and and um, just stay in the freezer and carve We're closing out the show tonight by welcoming back some old friends, the recently deceased. This Halloween-themed band joined us back in October, but they've returned to the WOSU studio to perform their brand new holiday tune to remind us that, at least for them, December isn't necessarily the most wonderful time of year. That's our show. Be sure to check out all of our stories at WOSU.org or on our free WOSU mobile app. And give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're leaving you today with music by Columbus singer-songwriter Colin Gowell and his song called Still Love Christmas. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Jackie Schaefer. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week. Riding out in the backyard, it's the same one you and me we used last year. I want you to know I still love Christmas I want you to know the spirit is near I want you to know I still love Christmas even if I don't show it this year
We are at the Wellington School. Uh, I am a math teacher. Uh, I teach in the upper school, so geometry, um, statistics, algebra 2. Um, and I'm also the chess coach here. We're going to do a position today. Position. Give you a position you're going to play with. Um, when I first started teaching at Wellington, I brought some kids over to one of the tournaments, and one of the section monitors was my old friend from middle school who I had known playing chess. And so we talked for, for about an hour, um, both saying that we wanted chess to be more widespread throughout Columbus. We started a nonprofit uh, to, uh, whose mission is to get students playing, especially from the inner city schools, to play chess. Okay, one other thing is they're going to play with clocks. Each person gets 10 minutes with a five-second delay. Okay. Um, and so I think one of the misconceptions is that that I've heard at least, um, and like from like students, you know, like, oh, I'm like not smart enough to play chess. And I think that that is a total misconception. I think anybody who, who is interested in the game um, can, can pick it up. And just like anything else in life, like the more you study and the more you do it, the better you get. Catch Columbus at its creative best on Broad and High, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock on WOSU-TV. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors, and viewers like you, thank you.